All right, you know, we're here in Rome, we're filming, and I bumped into Kelly and Nick from uh, South Jersey, Philadelphia, and Philadelphia, Philadelphia, South Philly, so I'm a West Philly boy, so you know what I'm saying? We probably met on 63rd Street and threw stones at each other. But so tell me, how did you guys discover this little hole in the wall by the forum? What's the story? So we were just walking down to the forum, and we saw people outside and eating outside. So we came inside and we looked around and the food just looked so delicious. And then we saw this Italian family and they were uh, asking this man to make them sa him sandwiches. And so tell me about the sandwiches. I, I kind of walked up while you guys were ordering. I'm kind of laughing. So what did you get? Because it's such a classic sandwich. My, my boyfriend, Nick, loves super sat. <laughs> so that was when he comes to Italy, he wanted to have a super sat sandwich. So they were actually ordering super seta. So that's where he came back to get a super seta sandwich. And I got the classic roasted peppers and fresh mozzarella. So it's Monday morning. Yesterday was the 25th of April, the big holiday day. Uh, we flew in, it was a crazy day in Rome. The Roman soccer team lost, everybody was depressed. They could have won the championship, whatever. <laughs> everybody was crying at the bars last night late. Um, but it's Monday morning and the city's alive, it's bustling. In our neighborhood, people are everywhere. People are wandering around, people are shopping. The city is alive, it's Rome, it's Monday, everybody's out. So these markets open up and there's these great vegetable markets all over this city. There's little plazas like this with people coming in, where there's meat, where there's fish, where there's great vegetables. This is sort of the lifeblood of the city. They, this isn't a place that's serviced by supermarkets. It's all these little small markets that are just built specifically for this all over the city. So let's do some food shopping. Artichokes are in season. Look how beautiful and tight these are. I mean, they're just completely closed. I mean, you have to think of these like a little flower that isn't quite open yet. So this is this beautiful, tight artichoke. You'll see these all over the menus, all throughout Italy. A Italians love artichokes. They have drinks made of artichokes, aperitifs, <laughs> digestives made of artichokes. Below these, or something you're starting to see in the States, is like a Romanesco. It's um, something like in the cauliflower family, but it's got these beautiful kind of pointy little spears that come out. You could break them apart, you can saute them. I cook these all the time. You see these a lot in the New York markets now, so the seed must have come over to our side. So typical layout, this is an old building. This building probably goes back pre-World War II, it's set up as a market. Your vegetable stalls are all in the middle because they don't require refrigeration, so there you'll have baked goods and vegetables. All the perimeters, all the stuff that you have to get plugged in, refrigeration, meat, and fish. And you know, this is Rome right in the middle of Italy, so it's kind of, not the poor south where it's just pork, pork, pork all the time. Here you find beef and here you find veal. And this is just beautiful veal. Rack of veal right there. Veal roasts, the individual muscles taken out of the legs. The top round. And then you're beginning to see the beef, the Italian beef. You know, we talk in America about grass-fed, corn-fed. This is all basically grass-fed beef here in Italy. That's how they do it all over Europe. And this has just got beautiful looking beef, decent looking marble, super healthy. Um, into the pork section. And again, nice marble inside that pork. It's beautiful looking pork. You can see that little loin on the top. It's got that nice little marble through it. That's going to be delicious. That was a happy pig. America's got the Great Plains. We have the subsidized cattle industry, this commodity industry. In Europe, they eat a lot of things we don't eat because it's culturally fine. They eat horses in Europe, and that's what this guy's selling. This is a, a stand that just sells horse meat. He's got ground horse meat, horse sausage, horse steaks, horse tail. And a little further down, past the horse section, you'll see an absolutely Beautiful little baby suckling pig. This is a little lamb, a little spring lamb that's been slaughtered. Little meat patties, some of them breaded, some of them made with chicken. I don't, don't ask me, God lo gold, and it's a golden chicken. Now, what they're f how they're feeding them to finish them that. I mean, some kind of major corn finish in the feed to get that kind of color. I mean, a little bit in France, you see that with the poulet de breast, where you'll see that almost yellow hue, and you'll get that beautiful fat on the breast between the skin and the meat that you never see in the States because we don't do our birds this way. Um, that's a good looking chicken. From a bigger bird, ground meat. I want to take a look when these women move. This is a really pretty strip steak here, which is great marble. Right here, Joe. This guy. Schoolsy. I mean, that's a beautiful little intermuscular marble for just beef that's ostensibly free range. 
In America, we have broccoli rabe. It's a different animal than the Italian broccoli rabe. You know, the Andy boy we always see, the stuff we grew up in. This is what broccoli rabe looks like in Italy. Much stalkier, much leafier, much less broccolier. Inside, here's one. You have a little tiny florette, a little tiny florette. But this is typically what Italian broccoli rabe looks like. It's stems and leaves and delicious, different than the American version. So if you're wondering where American broccoli rabe came from, this is its granddaddy. And this is a beautiful wild chicory. Just Italians love bitter greens, bitter green, bitter green. Beautiful stuff. Clean it, wash it, saute with a little bit of garlic, onion, toss some pasta in there. That's a great vegetarian dinner. We're going to eat lunch at a restaurant called Armando de Pantheon. It's in the middle of Rome, a short walk from the Spanish Steps, right behind the Pantheon. It's a great little Roman restaurant, real simple, real traditional, real rustic, it's run by a family. The chefs, the, the uh, dad, daughters in the kitchen. It's just a great little place, kind of this Roman vibe. Classic Roman menu, tripe, lamb, great pastas, simple vegetables in the season. We'll see artichokes today. Let's go inside and get the scoop. Bitter greens, tomatoes, gratin, zucchini cut, roasted peppers, just a little typical vegetable platter as a starter. We saw the artichokes in the market. It's spring, artichokes are everywhere, and these, these are just cooked and then chopped up a little bit, being sauteed in high heat with olive oil to make them crisp, crunchy, crocante. Classic Roman dish, salto bocca alla romana. It's veal, scallops, prosciutto, sage, just sauteed. It'll make a little bit of a sauce. That'll reduce down, it'll thicken it with butter and olive oil. That's ah, beautiful. Simple and beautiful. This is classic stewed tripe. Tomato sauce, and it's being served in a shell made with Parmesan cheese, known as a fico. We're just having some great appetizers. This is just, these are beautiful anchovies, Mediterranean anchovies, like a bruschette with a a little bit of butter, anchovy, toasted bread, a little bit of greens on the top. I'm all over that. This is lovely little simple dish, beans. Simple braised beans, balsamic vinegar, herring, a little raw red onion on the top. Just good flavors. The beans are meaty and delicious, and I love fish, I love beans, I love herring. I'm in. Classic Roman dish, artichokes Roman style. We know these are in season, we saw them in the market. These are really big artichokes. To be peeled down to the size, these were really, really, really big. So, where are we? We're not at Starbucks, no. This is arguably the best espresso place in all of Italy, certainly the best in Rome, Cafe Stan Eustachio. They buy their own beans every two months during South America, buying their beans, and I mean, you know, like Starbucks, hate Starbucks, whatever, there's been this espresso revolution, but it's all about beans, it's all about roasting, it's all about freshness, it's all about getting quality consistent. That's the roaster, that's it. They don't want to get any bigger. That's the man that does it. He's testing the roast on the beans now. He's pulling it out and he's looking at the beans to see the degree of roast here. When they're ready, they're ready. Roberto travels vigorously throughout South America, visiting his farmers, and he blends together about 12 different coffee beans from around South America. So it's something that needs a little bit of an explanation, and I wouldn't say that we would be the only ones exclusive. You have the best price. Very, I have the most competitive price. <laughs> you know, I, I, we want to drive business to DePaolo, and it's online. What's the name of your online site? Uh, DePaoloSelects.com. It's the greatest. For cheese, for tea, and ingredients, DePaoloSelects.com. It's my shield. They don't pay me. Trust me. I love these guys. So talk a little bit about the story, and he can tra if you want to translate, the story of the, uh, the business. How many years it's been here? How many generations? È diventato famoso nel tempo a Roma. The history of the company started about 71 years ago. Um, after the Second World War, uh, espresso coffee started to become uh, somewhat of a fashion um, around Italy. And if you put the two together of his unique style of roasting and blending his beans, and then cafe as a, as a fashion statement, and then the location of the place in, here in uh, San, Piazza Santo Stacchio, the, they made sort of like a marriage together at the right time. Joe, let's grab this shot. This is what the beans look like when they went in. There was the exact same batch of beans that he just roasted. And it takes about 20, 20 minutes. 12, 20. 20. 
20 minutes on that in that little wood oven over that wood flame to roast from here, not cooked, to cook to this color. And I mean, at the end of the day, that's what makes espresso espresso is that degree of roastedness, how fresh it is, how toasted it is. Here, because it's 20 minutes over wood in small batches, you get perfect color on the outside, plus that perfect cooked fruit to the middle, and these beans crack very easily. They break very easily, which means they put them in those grinders, which is gonna be like 10 minutes from now, easy to grind into a powder, smells great, you can hear him in his hands breaking them. And I, I still don't know how they get that crema, that foam on the top of his espresso, is like this thick. I mean, I don't know if they're adding egg whites when I'm not looking, but it's incredible. Look at the crema on the top, look how thick this is. Almost like it's got an emulsifier in it, it's insane. I mean, that's all the crema, that's all the top. All right, this is the kind of stuff I usually don't drink. Um, you know what I mean? Or whatever. You've had dinner somewhere, you want some dessert. I have no idea what it is, but we'll find out in a second. Hmm. Hmm. Actually, that's great. It's like a granite. It's not terribly sweet, almost a little, little, on, little on the bitter side of the coffee is. A little sweet, but it's very cold, very icy. It's a granite of, of, uh, of their espresso with a little whipped cream to sweeten it up a little bit. That's actually a great dessert. I don't know if you're gonna sleep for a while, but crunchy, cold, delicious, not too, too cloyingly sweet. It's nice, no? It's nice to eat too, actually. <laughs> I come here and I can buy these wonderful chocolates because you have this wonderful selection of chocolates and bonbons and truffles and almonds. And, but you also have a, a savory menu that incorporates chocolate into food from appetizer. And this is a very strange thing because, you know, uh, it's not so new. No. Because it used to be an old recipe. Some of these receipts are quite old. Because especially in Piemonte, then you know Piemonte is up to the north of Italy, uh, we, they used to make, uh, how you say hunting, uh, the, the food from hunting, like... Uh, game, game. The game. game. Uh, Boar with chocolate. and deer. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, not so, it's not so new. Now we make a new kind of recipes, obviously, but some, something is, is, is coming from uh, 200, 200 years, years ago. This is pear, and then you have oil, pear, and, pear, and pepper. Okay. This is a pear. So pear, olive oil, pepper, a little bit exactly. of hot pepper. Yeah, pepper is uh, pepperoncino, no? Yeah, Most yeah. Classic pepperoncino. A little Should water. A, a little bit of water, obviously. This kind of pasta is homemade, and then it doesn't need a, a long time. Because usually the pasta, the hard pasta, needs 12 minutes, 11 minutes. Right, this is fresh it's pasta, a, it's not yeah, pasta fresh set. pasta, pasta then it, Exactly. Right. Now what we're doing is we're finishing the pasta, letting the starch release a little bit, exactly. letting the water evaporate and cook the exactly. pasta all at the same time to, to bind You finish it. cooking uh, with the sausage. Scusi. This is a pecorino. Pecorino. This is 100% chocolate, but it's not only, it's not exactly raw. It's momentito, quite momentito. Well. It's a kind of sweet, because this dish is not only salt. It's a kind of, you say agrodolce, then it's sweet salt. and sour. Sweet. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Hey folks, I know I said we'd stay in Rome, but we gotta make one trip north up into Umbria, to Spoleto, for some real authentic porchetta. One of the great Italian traditions all over the country, including the north, is this beautiful roast pig. I mean, you, you know, Sarah Jenkins has that porchetta stand that's so famous down in New York City, but this is, this is Italian street food, this is Italian country food. And what we have is these really beautiful, these are organic, free range, this is not, you know, commodity pork. This is pork that was slaughtered today. It's gonna hang tonight to dry a little bit be clean tomorrow it's going to go in an oven overnight and for about six seven eight hours it's just going to slow roast in an oven until it becomes like confit i mean this is they do this in the american south too like a pig roast well picture a pig roast but it turns into a sandwich forget them oh man i just great pork it's crazy facciamo vedere come si controlla come si Folks, you know, you've been, you've been watching the show, you've seen me in all kinds of walk-in boxes. 
You know I love meat, you know I love dry aged meat. The smell in this room is so dope. That's it's so good. It's just funky, dry aging fat, healthy, delicious. Every once in a while you need to do this work to, to clean the, the mold off. So this takes three, about three months worth of aging in an ambient temperature. There is no artificial heating. Um, that's why you have to maintain the, the mold, uh, control the mold. So that's only the first 15 days and then they dry up, dry out all the moisture and then you don't need to do it anymore, you just hang it up. Rub in, rub in. Cut by hand. Paper thin. Sweet and buttery. Delicioso. Buonissimo. While we were in the region, we also swung by this little osteria with a mom in the kitchen, her daughter working by her side, and her son running the dining room. They're actually closed that night, but they opened up just for us. So we had a great private meal, and it's a great example of the, the simplicity and the beauty of Italian cooking, and also how many of the commercial kitchens around Italy in restaurants are actually run by women. We're in the kitchen here with the chefs. We're starting this meal with just a really simple omelet of local herbs that I've never heard of. These are just herbs that grow in the area that have no name. They're just wild. They pick them. They know what they're doing. And I've got these beautiful little tiny pencil asparagus that are just coming in that are just blanched, shocked with this ridiculous olive oil. So we're going to get little plates of this, lots of vegetables, which makes me happy. This is more of these crazy herbs. So I have these omelets coming out all night long. You can see the fresh eggs from the farm. We saw these in the market yesterday in Rome. You know, artichokes are in season now. With asparagus, little herbs, little stuff's coming in, puntarella. We've got a wonderful little fava beans. We peel them ourselves. I put a little olive oil. Fed me so. A little bit of salt, a little bit of olive oil. They're not even cooked. We're just popping them. So. Pecorino. Pecorino. She wants, she wants me to get some pecorino, which there is on the table. So I'm going to get some pecorino cheese. And then we're going to come outside and show you the table in a couple of minutes because it's just lined with um, salumi from local producers, cheese, olive oils, lots of wines, and lots of smiley, happy faces. So farro, sausage, leeks, a really hot pan, and a little onion. A type of onion. That looks delicious. Così. No, va bene. Bene, va bene. Va bene. The mamma is a food uh, the olive oil, sage, and this and uh, white vinegar, and they make a fantastic uh, crostini with uh, chick pork or pork chick. <laughs> It's his show. It's over. I'm finished. Ten years on television, 120 shows, and now I'm done. Colomeco, you're good. But who was that guy? We want him. Who's the crazy guy? Make the ricotta fried cheese and a put in olive oil. Drain the oil so it's not so heavy and greasy. This is fantastic fat. Sublime. This is. Now this is a for eight people is like one kilo. Yeah, two pounds. A little over two pounds. Mm -hmm. but now the, the, the sauce for the pasta, the strangozzi, you put the olive oil first and the parsley. After you can chop the garlic like this. You see that oil is not too, too hot yet or it'd be all spitting and sputtering. This is the asparagus. We put the tomato. Che tipo di tomato? San Marzano? San Marzano. 
cercando test buona buona thank you yeah, a little bit of the water left from the pasta still in the pasta helps make the sauce a little thinner helps the sauce coat notice too not too too much sauce huh just enough to coat the pasta that's beautiful that's what we like to see chefs to taste the food you know I'm always telling these guys in the kitchen the chef's not tasting the food I don't know what's the matter we, is it is it guesswork you have to taste you never know look at this this is for me eh? <laughs> Qual è più buono? Questo o questo? I think this, eh? <laughs> Guarda, look at the color, look at the color.